Coming up on Locked on Dodgers, we're talking about the Hall of Fame ballot. Who's in, who's out, and who's on the bubble. So, let's get Locked on Dodgers. You are Locked on Dodgers. Your daily Los Angeles Dodgers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hello, Dodger fans. I am Jeff Snyder, Baseball Essential, and this is Locked On Dodgers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Vince and I are doing another split episode today, so he'll be with you for the second half of this show. Thank you for making Locked On Dodgers your first listen every day. Remember, this show is free and available on all podcast platforms and on YouTube simply by searching for Locked On Dodgers. This is the daily podcast covering the Los Angeles Dodgers, bringing you the smart fans perspective on our boys in blue. And as I mentioned at the top, I'm going to be talking about the Hall of Fame ballot. There's about 25 players or so on the ballot, and uh, I'm going to go through each of them, obviously spending more time on some of them than others. And by the end of this, by the end of my part of this episode, uh, you will know who I would be voting for if I had a vote in the Hall of Fame voting, which I don't. Uh, so that's the plan for me. I don't actually know for sure what Vince is going to talk about, but he will introduce his topic to you when his part comes. So uh, I'm going to start, I think the order I'm going to go in, uh, I'm just going to go in alphabetical order, actually. Um, so up first, we have Bobby Abreu. And Bobby Abreu is one who I would very much like to vote for. Uh, Bobby Abreu, I think, is underrated in a lot of ways and uh you know i i don't think bobby abreu would be an undeserving hall of famer he wouldn't be the best player in the hall of fame he's definitely not you know uh one of those inner circle guys or first ballot guys but that's okay because this is his third time on the ballot so uh he's not going to get in in fact it's already mathematically impossible for him to get in just based on the the votes that we know uh but bobby abreu is a guy who I would mark and say, okay, let's see if I can fit him in my 10-player ballot. Uh, up next is Barry Bonds. Barry Bonds is maybe the best hitter in baseball. He was also an elite fielder in his prime, an elite base runner. Uh, obviously, you, the the reason Bob, Barry Bonds isn't in the Hall of Fame is obvious to everyone. Um, I'm going to talk about him and Clemens together, actually. Barry Bonds and Roger Clemens. Two of the best players of all time, both in their 10th and final year on the ballot, and both of them currently, based on what we know of public ballots, both uh, have the numbers to get in this year. They will not get in because public ballots are always more friendly towards uh, some of these more controversial candidates than the private ballots are. And so neither of them is going to get in. Uh, It baffles me that they don't have the same number of votes. Uh, So far right now, we know of 113 votes for Bonds and 111 for Clemens. And for me, they have the same case. Both of them were already among the best in baseball before they started using steroids from when we can tell they started using them. Um, And both of them are jerks in real life and have their issues. You know, uh, Roger Clemens had issues with uh, Minnie McCready, an underage country singer who he may or may not have had an intimate relationship with Barry Bonds beat up his wife and then later his girlfriend, uh, one of them while they were pregnant. So, you know, they're both jerks in real life um, and have their problems. So it's got to be one or, or both of them or neither of them. And I would be inclined to vote for both of them, but they are definitely on my list of guys I might bump if I had more than I wanted to or more than 10 that I wanted to put on the list. Uh, up next is Mark Burley. Mark Burley was a very good pitcher. Doesn't cut the mustard for me as a Hall of Famer. Would not get a vote. Um, you know, he, he's one of those guys who, if I, I, I have a pretty broad view of what the Hall of Fame should be. And if it was a little bit broader, I might be able to make make a case for Mark Burley. But for me, no Mark Burley. Todd Helton is an interesting one. Todd Helton would get my vote. Uh, he was a great player. We don't know what he would have done outside of Colorado. He played his whole career in Colorado. But what we do know is that it's not as simple as... He was a creation of Colorado because a lot of guys have played for the Rockies and very few of them were ever as good as Todd, Todd Helton was. So uh, he did the best he could do with the situation he has handed. And for me, Todd Helton would get my vote. Up next is Ryan Howard. First time on the ballot. 
uh, very good for a couple years, uh, overrated for a little while, won an MVP, didn't deserve. Um, yeah, Ryan Howard, good player, had a good career, made some good money. No chance he's a Hall of Famer. Uh, looks like he's most likely going to fall off the ballot on the first ballot, which is uh, what he should do. Tim Hudson is in his second year. He's in danger of falling off the ballot also. Uh, Hudson is a guy I would love to try to fit onto my onto my ballot. Um, another guy kind of in the Burley camp where if I was a little bit more uh, big hall kind of guy, Tim Hudson might get my vote. Uh, but for me, he just doesn't quite get there. Next is Torrey Hunter. On his second time on the ballot, I'm surprised he made it through two times. He's also probably going to fall off the ballot this time, uh, which is probably what he should do. Torrey Hunter was a very good player for a little while, but, you know, not a Hall of Famer. Up next is Andrew Jones. Andrew Jones, to me, is a clear Hall of Famer. Uh, he was a very good hitter, and he was an elite defensive center fielder, uh, val which is probably the most valuable thing you can be, except maybe an elite defensive shortstop, maybe. Um, Andrew Jones just... You know, outstanding defense and also a very good hitter for every team he played for except the Dodgers. And so Andrew Jones, to me, is a, a pretty obvious Hall of Famer, so he'd get my vote. Up next is Jeff Kent. Jeff Kent is in his second to last time on the ballot, and uh, it's, it's a hard one. Jeff Kent doesn't get my vote, I don't think. Uh, he's right there at the cusp, and he's a guy who on another day I might vote for him. Um, but, you know, Jeff Kent, yeah, he had the most home runs for a second baseman. The problem with, for me with Jeff Kent is he wasn't a good second baseman. And so if you would put Babe Ruth at second base, he would have the most home runs at second baseman and would have been a bad de bad defense at second baseman. So for me, it's like, yeah, Kent was, I guess, good enough to stay at second base, but was he really? Like, I don't know, Jeff Kent just doesn't quite do it for me. And, and all he was was, you know, yeah, just doesn't quite do it for me. Uh, let's do one or two more and then we'll take a quick break. Tim Linscom, first time on the ballot, probably last time on the ballot as it should be. Very, very good for a couple of years, flamed out very young and he's just, you know, he's done and, and, you know, uh, had a great career, happy for him, not a hall of famer. Joe Nathan, uh, probably more of a hall of famer than, than Tim Linscom. He's probably going to get roughly the same number of votes. Uh, Joe Nathan was a very good closer. Uh, and, you know, maybe the best closure in baseball for a little while. But for me, the, the bar for closure is set pretty high. You have to have been pretty elite. Maybe I'm going to do a whole episode on, or a whole segment sometime on my thought on closures in the Hall of Fame. But Joe Nathan, you know, I, personally, I think there are closures in the Hall of Fame right now who don't deserve to be. And Joe Nathan would only make that situation worse. So uh, Joe Nathan is a no for me. So I'm going to come back in a minute. I'm going to finish out the ballot. We're about halfway through it. Uh, so thank you again for making Locked on Dodgers your first lesson every day and keep it locked on Dodgers. Hey, New Year's, New Year's resolutions, want to get in shape, all that good stuff. You need Built Bar. It's delicious and it's good for you. Tastes like a candy bar, maybe even better. But unlike candy bars that have, you know, hundreds and hundreds of calories and, you know, dozens of grams of sugar and carbs, Built Bar... 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar and carbs, 17 grams of protein, and they're all covered in 100% real chocolate. So everything you could want is right there in a Built Bar. If you don't know what flavor you like, get a mix box and you can try a bunch of different flavors. And then the next time you order, you'll know what you want. And every time you order, go to Built.com and use promo code LOCKED15 and you will get 15% off your order. That's promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at Built.com. All right, uh, so we've gone through through the ends. That puts us in the O's, and that is David Ortiz. David Ortiz, for me, uh, absolutely gets my vote. Uh, now that Edgar Martinez is in, uh, I think David Ortiz is probably the second best DH in uh, in baseball history, like among guys who really, really were purely DHs. Plenty of guys played DH at, at parts in their career and made it to the Hall of Fame, but David Ortiz and Edgar Martinez basically played their whole careers at DH. And uh, Edgar Martinez was better than David Ortiz, but David Ortiz was very, very good. And for me, clearly a Hall of Famer, especially if we factor in the fame part, as I've talked about on previous episodes. Uh, there are very few players more famous than David Ortiz in the last couple decades. So he is uh, a Hall of Famer in my book and hopefully going to get in on his first ballot this year. 
Uh, his former teammate, Jonathan Papelbon, for also first time on the ballot, uh, has one vote so far that we know of. Uh, hopefully that's the only vote. Jonathan Papelbon is not a Hall of Famer, and he is not deserving of any happiness in life. He's a piece of garbage. Uh, how do I feel about Jonathan Papelbon? Huh, who knew? Andy Pettit. Andy Pettit is a guy who I think is probably deserving. He's one of those guys who will be on the cusp for me just as far as, okay, do I have room for him? If I have room for him on my ballot, he's a guy I would definitely feel good about voting for. Andy Pettit was more good for a long time than ever spectacular, but he was really good for a pretty darn long time. And so Andy Pettit for me is a Hall of Famer. Uh, he's not going to get in this year, but he will stay on the ballot. This is his fourth year. He'll make it to a fifth year. Next is Manny Ramirez. Manny Ramirez is one of the hardest ones. Uh, it's his sixth year on the ballot. And Manny Ramirez, obviously, based on his play on the field, he deserves to be in the Hall of Fame. But he was suspended multiple times for PEDs. And, you know, he was a one-dimensional player. He was just offense. He, you know, he couldn't play defense, couldn't run the bases very well. He was one-dimensional, and that dimension, he was one of the best ever to do it. And so Manny Ramirez is a guy I'd really like to get on my ballot. He's a guy I would go back and forth with. I would be really torn on Manny just because of the PED suspensions. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, in a minute, and maybe right now. Here's my, my thing on PED suspensions uh, and PEDs in general. If you got suspended for PEDs, like once once discipline was in place, once the rules were in place and you actually got suspended for it, that is a big strike against you for me in the Hall of Fame voting. If it was before, I have no problem voting for Bonds and Clemens. I think Mark McGuire should be in the Hall of Fame. Uh, you know, those guys, because it was before the rules were really in place, baseball was basically secretly encouraging it, all that stuff. Um, but Manny Ramirez got suspended twice with the rules in place. That's a big strike against him in my book, so I'm not sure about him. Up next is Alex Rodriguez, who kind of in the same boat. This is his first year on the ballot. And uh, for me, the difference, two differences between A-Rod and Manny Ramirez. One, A-Rod was only suspended once. Um, and two, A-Rod was maybe the best player in baseball history. And including he was already elite, very, very good before he used the steroids, um, you know, I don't know if it's a double standard that I, I'm more likely to vote for A-Rod than for Manny. I don't know for sure. Uh, but, you know, A-Rod was the best player I've ever seen play. Um, probably, maybe Mike Trout uh, passes him up. But A-Rod was so, so good uh, even before he did the steroids. And it probably had his best years before he did the steroids. So that's a, it's a hard one for me. Uh, but I would be inclined to vote for A-Rod. Up next is Scott Rowland, no doubt Hall of Famer. Scott Rowland should be in the Hall of Fame. Scott Rowland was an excellent hitter and one of the five best defensive third basemen of all time, maybe three best. Scott Rowland, elite player. The only knock against him is he couldn't stay healthy sometimes, so his career, as far as number of plate appearances, was relatively short. But Scott Rowland, for me, is, you know, I'm not saying he's like an, an, an inner circle Hall of Famer, or anything, but Scott Rowland, I would have had no problem voting for him on his first time on the ballot. I think he is absolutely deserving, and uh, he would be the first name I check on my ballot, honestly, because he's the one I feel most strongly about. Uh, next is Jimmy Rollins, first year on the ballot. G Jimmy Rollins, kind of like his old teammate Ryan Howard, really good player, won an MVP, probably didn't deserve, and, you know, not a Hall of Famer. Had a good career, made a lot of money, not a Hall of Famer. Next is Kurt Schilling, his 10th and final year on the ballot. Uh, Kurt Schilling, by performance on the field, is absolutely a Hall of Famer, with no doubt in my mind. Um, I, I've i already said with Bonds and Clemens and, and other people, doesn't really matter to me what they're like off the field. I think that the Hall of Fame should be based on baseball for performance. The only thing that would give me pause in voting for Schilling is – uh, that he was kind of petulant last year when he didn't make it and and said he didn't even want to be on the ballot this year. And, you know, something about Kurt Schilling, you know, something about that kind of rubs me the wrong way. But then I might be tempted to vote for him, you know, out of spite. Oh, you don't want to be voted in? Well, guess what? We're going to vote you in anyway. 
so Schilling would be a hard one for me. Uh, up next is Gary Sheffield. For me, Gary Sheffield is absolutely a Hall of Famer. He's another guy who probably did PEDs before it was against the rules, didn't get caught after it was against the rules if he was doing them. And uh, for me, Gary Sheffield was such a very good hitter that uh, he's a Hall of Famer for me and w- would make my ballot. Sammy Sosa is a really tricky one for me. Like, I've got this. He's also in his 10th and final year on the ballot. And my thing about Sosa is I believe that Sammy Sosa was a creation of steroids. I watched Sammy Sosa play before he started using steroids. He was a little fast guy with a good arm who was not very good at baseball. And then he took the steroids and he became a huge power hitter and had a stretch for six years or so where he was the best power hitter in baseball. Uh, And that's his entire Hall of Fame resume is that stretch after he did the steroids. That's the difference for me between Sammy Sosa and, you know, Mark McGuire hit 49 homers as a rookie. Yeah, it was a rabbit ball year, but it it was real. Mark McGuire had real power in college, everything. He was a power hitter before he started using the steroids. Sammy Sosa wasn't. I believe Sammy Sosa was a creation of steroids. And so for me, he wouldn't get my vote. Uh, And and that's, that's, I don't know if that's, consistent or right or not, but that's how I feel about him. Mark Teixeira, first year on the ballot. Uh, He's not going to make it to a second year, and he shouldn't. Another guy, good player, made a lot of money. Good for him. Uh, Moving on. Omar Vizquel, uh, fifth year on the ballot. His numbers have dropped precipitously uh, because since the last time people voted for the Hall of Fame, we found out that he is probably a wife beater. And so... Uh, that has convinced some people who had voted for him that they shouldn't have. Uh, spoiler alert, they shouldn't have in the first place because he could not hit and was a good defensive shortstop who was uh, not as good as some people think he was. And so to get in the Hall of Fame when you're as bad at hitting as Omar Vizquel was, you have to be otherworldly like Ozzy Smith. Ozzy Smith was a better hitter than Omar Vizquel and still wouldn't have deserved to get in if not for the fact that he was Literally the best shortstop in baseball history. Omar Vizquel, not the best shortstop in baseball history. Just a good, solid, you know, good defensive shortstop. Not a Hall of Famer by any means. And finally, Billy Wagner. Billy Wagner is a guy I would definitely like to get on my ballot. Um, As far as relief pitchers go, I think Billy Wagner is better than several who are already in the Hall of Fame, including Trevor Hoffman. Uh, You know, I don't know if Wagner would make my cut. I'll find out in a minute, I guess, when I count up how many guys I want to put in. Uh, But Billy Wagner, for me, uh, I would like to get him on my ballot. And that's everybody. So uh, going here, uh, I'm just going to look now at the current ranking by the current percentage. Right now, David Ortiz, Barry Bonds, and Roger Clemens, all, according to to Ryan Thibodeau, all have enough votes from the – or high enough percentage among the the public votes we know to get in. Um, they would probably all get my vote. Scott Rowland is next. He definitely would. Then you got Schilling, Helton, Sheffield, Andrew Jones, Billy Wagner, A Rod. And so that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's ten right there. Um, the only guy who I feel really strongly about down below, well, Bobby Abreu and Andy Pettit. I'd like to get both of them on my ballot. And so that's where I might consider bumping Kurt Schilling. Um yeah, in fact, let's bump Schilling for, for Bobby Abreu. And then Andy Pettit, it would be one where, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, I might consider bumping Bonds and Clemens for Pettit and Manny. Um, but, uh, you know, Pettit and Manny both also had their PED things, so that might not be uh, intellectually consistent. So I guess my final ballot is David Ortiz, Barry Bonds, Roger Clemens, Scott Rowland, Todd Helton, Gary Sheffield, Andrew Jones, Billy Wagner, Alex Rodriguez, and Bobby Abreu. That's my 10. Uh, And that's my story, and I'm sticking to it, as Colin Ray said. So uh, you didn't ask, but I told you anyway. That's going to do it for me. Like I said, Vince will come along. I'm not sure what he's going to talk about, but it will be baseball-related, maybe even Dodgers-related. But we want to thank you again for making Locked on Dodgers your first listen every day. And Vince will be along in a minute. Bet Online would like to wish you a happy new betting year as sports continue their marches to the playoffs and beyond. Bet Online remains the number one spot for all the best sports wagering action for 2022. If you're trying to make some money this year, Bet Online is the best place to try it out. A new year, and they got a new updated website right now that you can check out on your laptop or mobile device. 
You sign up today and use the promo code Locked On, you'll get a 50% welcome bonus after your first deposit. That's an extra 50% on top of your first deposit with the promo code Locked On at Bet Online. From football, basketball, hockey, boxing, and UFC, right to your favorite Vegas casino games, don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers available for 2022. Bet Online is the fastest and easiest way to wager on all your favorite sports. Bet Online, where the game starts. Yo, 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 Dodger fans. Vince here to close out the episode. And still not a lot going on in the baseball world, but I do check the Dodgers website every other day or so just to see you know, what they're working on over there since they can't talk about any current players. And the article that was one of the, the main articles from – from Thursday was the top pop culture moments for all 30 teams. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. And I didn't read through all the other teams. I went straight to the Dodgers one. And the Dodgers one was very, very lazy. Um, They picked the movie 42, which, you know, for obvious reasons, you know, makes sense of, of it. But I wouldn't necessarily call it a pop culture moment. It was a movie based on, you know, historical facts based on Jackie Robinson. And it's not like it transcended movies or it's not like it was a moment when it came out. It was, you know, maybe the first major theatrical release of of Jackie Robinson, but there had been other Jackie Robinson like movies and biopics before, you know, looking back on it now. Yes. Chadwick Boseman did play, Jackie Robinson, and obviously, you know, he, he's been a big part of, of the last few years after his death and, and you know, his legacy. But I don't know. It, it just, of all the things for the Dodgers, pop culture moments, you know, the movie 42 didn't necessarily seem like a top, like a pop culture moment. Now, the blurb that comes with it says the Sandlot would have also been acceptable, as well as all the Curb Your Enthusiasm episodes that feature Dodger Stadium. And that's when I realized this guy was lazy because there's only been, as far as I know, and I've watched it, I think, twice through now, there's only been one episode of Curb Your Enthusiasm filmed at Dodger Stadium. And it was a great episode. I, w- I will admit that. That that, that per- particular episode could have been the moment. And it also sparked the documentary about how it helped somebody uh, beat a murder charge because they were at the game that day that they were filming. You can see him in the background of a few of the scenes and it ended up, you know, helping him out with his alibi. And it's a pretty interesting documentary uh, if you want to check that out. But yeah, for Dodgers, they, I mean, even the sound lot is more of a, a pop culture moment, not necessarily a moment, but more, more like a you know, pop culture, I guess, phenomenon would, would be the word to a certain extent where, you know, everybody's seen the sound lot. It's most people's, or a lot of people's favorite baseball movie. You know, it doesn't necessarily feature the Dodgers, but it's, you know, Dodger related there in Los Angeles. You know, they talk about the Dodgers. They're wearing Dodger gear. They end up at Dodger Stadium at the end, you know, when the Jet steals home. So those, yeah, it just felt lazy to me. And, and, then you know, if we're going to air some grievances, that would be a grievance I would air. Uh, and then it got me thinking about other pop culture moments at Dodger Stadium. And, and honestly, there's been movies filmed at Dodger Stadium or have had Dodger Stadium. I think the first Naked Gun film was there. One of the Superman movies was there. Um, I know in one of the Fast and Furious movies, he's, he's in the parking lot drifting around. It's been in a Transformers movie. It's been in, I think, there's been a few other movies, but those are like the main ones. Uh, but I think, you know, pop culture moments, I think some of the concerts that Dodger Stadium has hosted would would qualify. I mean, just some of these names that have performed at Dodger Stadium in the past. Kiss, the Rolling Stones, the Beatles, the Bee Gees, Elton John, Simon and Garfunkel, Madonna, Beyonce, Guns N' Roses, Eric Clapton, U2, Bruce Springsteen, Michael Jackson with the Jacksons, um, you know, Fleetwood Mac, Earth, Wind, and Fire, and then recently Paul McCartney with Ringo Starr as a guest performer. You've, you, you know, you've had a lot, and Gabriel Iglesias is coming up. You're going to be the first uh, comedian to perform at Dodger Stadium. So I think those are more pop culture moments than any of the movies, too, because, you know, even though they weren't, nece- some of those weren't necessarily 
one night only or a, a thing. It's it's you know that's a moment in time when you can see people performing at Dodger Stadium when you got the stadium in the background and everything else and you know the Dodger Stadium's hosted a lot of other things that's not necessarily pop culture but you know it's had the hockey game had the NHL Stadium Series was there it's hosted soccer before it's hosted boxing it's hosted cricket even it's hosted the Olympics it's hosted the World Baseball Classic. Um, the Pope, I think, did a mass there back in, in the 80s. So it, it's been a part of a lot of things. And, yeah, it was just a, a lazy take on uh, the writer's end of, of the, the best pop culture moment for the Dodgers. I do think that <clears throat> while 42 is – and this is just – this was me just listing stuff that's been Dodger Stadium related. There's also obviously other things that have been Dodger related – um, but for the most part, you know, Dodger Stadium and really Dodger related, it, it's similar. I can't remember any other specific pop culture moments that is just like Dodger specific, but I'm sure there has been. And I'm sure if if you out there listening uh, want to remind me of some, you can go right ahead because, uh, you know, definitely take that and, and, and be like, oh, yeah, I forgot about that. But for them to have 42, not necessarily a pop culture moment for me. It was more of, you know, celebration of Jackie Robinson and then now Chadwick Boseman uh, posthumously. So, yeah, it was late. And then, like I said, to say all the Caribbean enthusiasms that were filmed at Dodger Stadium when it's only been one Caribbean enthusiasm episode that's filmed at Dodger Stadium, a little lazy, my guy. But, you know, I'm not going to fault you for it. You had to go through all 30 teams. I'm sure it wasn't easy. I mean, just looking right above the Dodgers at the Diamondbacks and, uh, he said, it is near impossible to find a D-backs moment for this list. So we came up with Randy Johnson's cameo appearance on an old Disney Channel sitcom called The Jersey about a magical jersey. I actually remember that show. I remember Randy Johnson being on it. And, yeah, Diamondbacks are uh, clearly not relevant in pop culture. So at the very least for the Dodgers, we it's I'm glad that we can complain about what their choice was and bring up other choices that, uh, would have better suited the answer to the question of the best pop culture moment for the Dodgers. But either way, um, yeah, it, it's fun to be a Dodge fan. And and for some of the reasons I've listed above and some reasons that will probably come in the future. So that's all I got for today's episode. That's going to close out our week. Thank you all for listening. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you for making Locked On Dodgers your first listen of the day every day. If you want to get a hold of us, you can get a hold of us via social media. We are on Twitter and Instagram at Locked On Dodgers. Those DMs are open. The DMs are also open on Jeff's Twitter at Snydog and me at Vincent Perio. You can also send us an email, LockedOnDodgers at gmail.com, or give us a call or leave us a text or a voicemail, 323-863-LOCK. That's 323-863-5625. We're here every weekday morning, and we hope you'll be with us when you get in your car or if you're at home. Tell your smart device play podcast, Locked on Dodgers. And remember, you don't have to agree. You just have to listen. Have a good one.